Hi, thanks for joining me. Today I'm going to be talking about my top 10 wild camping tips. I know these tips are really designed at beginners, but if you've got some experience, maybe there's one or two that will be useful for you as well, so it might be worth listening to them all. We're going to cover a few different subjects in wild camping, but I kind of thought through what I would say to someone who's just starting out, and this is what I've put together in one video for you. Just before I get into this video, I'd just like to make a polite request to all of you. Please, if you're going to go out wild camping and you're going to go out into nature, into the landscape, take all of your rubbish with you. Don't leave anything behind. Remember to leave no trace. When you're thinking about your first wild camping trip, a lot of ideas and notions of what it's going to be like go through your head, but they're not necessarily based on much actual real world experience. So it's a little bit of a fantasy and you're perhaps thinking about the bigger picture, but maybe not so much of the smaller things. And it's important to understand that a lot of what you have in your head about what gear you're going to use and how you're going to use it is going to change so dramatically over time. What you want now will be very different to what you want in six months time and then in a year's time and so on. But, but one thing's clear to me, we make quite a big change in what we're doing between our first wild camp and our second. And it's because of that that my first tip for you is to have a practice wild camp. Now what I mean by practice wild camp is not one in a garden. I mean to actually go on a wild camp, but not necessarily to the summit that you've got in your head or that location that's you know miles away to hike to. But I think go to somewhere that's within half an hour of your car or Oh, if you're not taking a car, that you've got some way out, then maybe you can get home easily from it. Maybe it's just up a small hill, something that's not complicated. Just for one night, but one where you can get away from it easily. Because what happens is that the way you use your kit in the real world is often quite different from what you have in your head about how that's going to go. People often find the first time they go camping that they just take too much stuff with them. But you have to go through that experience and that process in order to do it. So what I'm saying to you is that do that in an area where you can get out if it's wrong and you've really made bad choices, that you can just get away from it. Because it would be worse if you go up a hill and you really are at altitude or something, or you go to somewhere that's a long way away and you found that you've made mistakes and you're not happy with it. Uh, and then it's really hard to kind of back out of it. You've got your idea in your head of when you want to go, keep that, just do a short wild camp beforehand and it'll make a lot of difference. I think it's a really good idea. Okay, and my second tip for you kind of builds on the idea of what you need and what you don't need and how do you figure that out? I'm going to be doing a kit list, but the problem with kit lists is that they are very individual based on how you want to camp and you should always camp and hike the way that you want to do it. So whatever that is, that's your style and your way of doing it. But that does take time to refine. But when we're looking at the, the stuff we've got, we can end up saying, well, we've got so much stuff here. What am I going to do with all of this? Do I need all of this? And what am I actually going to use? So my, so my second tip for you is how to separate the stuff that you need and that you don't need. And the way to do it, to begin with, is to put things into two piles. What stuff do you need in order to get through the night and stay alive? And what stuff is just stuff that you want to take? For instance, stuff that you want to take could be a table, maybe a small chair, radio, things like that. Those are things that you might want to have with you. But the things that you need may well be the sleeping mat, the sleeping bag, the tent or whatever shelter you're using. Those are things that you absolutely need to take to complete the wild camp. Actually take your stuff out physically and separate it into two piles. Stuff that you must have in order to get that wild camp done. Then when you look at all the other stuff that's left over, that stuff's optional. You don't have to have that. So that the stuff that you need should include safety things like first aid kits and all that kind of stuff. You have to have that stuff there. But you're gonna find you've bought lots of extra things that when you think about it, you'll start wondering, did I really need that little collapsible table? Maybe not, and you can start shaving off weight like that. Okay, my third tip for you, if you're pitching a tent and it's windy, get a carabiner and hook that onto your backpack at a secure point and then hook one of the guy lines on because imagine you're trying to, imagine it's really windy 
you're trying to take the tent out of your bag. When your tent catches the wind, as you open it up, it will turn into a sail and it can just get ripped out of your hands. And I've known people to have really expensive tents, like absolutely top end, just ripped out of their hands and then off into the distance, gone. If you wanna make sure that your tent stays with you, put your backpack down, get your tent in its bag, have the guy line, one of the guy lines at the top, which is gonna be facing into the wind, hook that onto your bag and then start putting your tent up. Because at that point, when you put your tent up, you've got something that's holding your tent back from getting blown away. And that, can, that could save you from losing your tent. So my fourth tip for you is a bit of a safety tip. And I'm a little bit surprised when I look online and see how many people still don't know this. But I think for beginners, for me, when I started out, it was one of the things I was like, wow, really, is this true? And that is about cotton. <laughs> Sounds like it's gonna be really boring, right? <laughs> it's not that bad. When cotton's wet, you lose 25 times more of your body heat. And that means that hypothermia can set in really quickly. And that can even be in warmer climates, but it's really worth bearing in mind the effects that cotton has. And it's really slow to dry as well. It takes ages to dry out. It's a very ineffective and dangerous material to wear when you're, walk, when you're going into more exposed conditions. Now, you might think, well, why are all t-shirts made of cotton? Cotton's very comfortable to wear, it's easy to look after, but it's not a good material for doing active mountain-based kind of uh, sports and so on. It is really a dangerous material to be wearing. Now, that doesn't mean that there won't be loads of people who've worn cotton all their lives and got away with it. Um, but at the same time, there are a lot of people who end up with hypothermia because of the fact that they're wearing cotton. It's a really bad idea. So you should be looking for synthetic materials instead, such as merino wool and various other synthetic fabrics, which are going to be much better and they're warmer when they're wet. That's not to say they're as warm when they're wet as when they're dry, but they don't make you lose body heat at the rate that cotton does because it's shocking with cotton. It really just sucks the heat out of your body. So you can look that up online. If you're not sure about what I'm saying, Google it and check it out. You'll see what I mean. It's really worth paying attention to. Okay, my fifth tip for you is also kind of another safety bit. It's a, more of a comfort tip perhaps, but in your sleeping shelter or tent, you need to insulate from below. And that means to have something that's going to stop the ground drawing the heat out from you. Because when you're lying down, what happens is that the ground is cold. The heat will leave your body and go into the ground. You can use windscreen protectors, which are silver on one side and have the silver side facing up. That can help really a lot. Having an insulated mat really makes a difference to lie on. And it's worth looking at the R values of mats and making sure you've got something that's insulated. Now, in the summer months, if you live in a, in a climate that's warmer and you have summer months and so on, that's not gonna affect you as much. But as soon as the temperature starts to drop even a bit, it can make a difference. But it's worth remembering that even in a country where it can be warm in the summer, if you're camping higher up, the temperature can be a world away from what it is at ground level. You can be at ground level daytime and it's like 25 degrees or so. Camp up at nighttime, you could be looking at five degrees. It can be as dramatic as that. And then that can start to get uncomfortable quite quickly. It's really noticeable. So insulate from below as well. Uh, okay, and my sixth tip for you is to take walking poles. Try them out at least, because walking poles, the collapsible kind that you see people walking with, I think a lot of people look at that and think, oh, maybe they've got an injury or they're not too sure about walking or their balance isn't that good. Walking poles can make walking up to 30% more efficient and easier. They make a big difference when you're going downhill as well as uphill. I mean, for downhill, I think they really excel. They're good for uphill as well, but they make you more efficient. So you can go further, faster, or travel more easily. It really does make a difference and it's spreading some of the load over onto your arms and it's also taking some of the pressure off your joints as well which is also another good thing about them. I, th I think that most people that I see regarding walking poles 
this is what I did. I was dismissive of them at the start because I thought, why do I need that? I don't have like a medical issue, so I don't need to use walking poles. And then people kept saying, no, try them, try them, try them. I tried them once and that was it. I was <laughs> converted and all, that was it. I was done, sold on them. Uh, they really are great. You can go with just one, can make a reasonable difference. You don't have to use two. You don't have to use them all the time. And a lot of um, backpacks have got a point on the side of them where you can put the poles to keep them out of the way when you don't want to use them. They've got storage points on the, on the backpacks. But especially if you're coming down steeper terrain where it's a bit slippery, wow, do they make a difference. They really, really do because you can go down much more confidently and that increases your speed. It just makes the whole thing more enjoyable. Definitely check them out. You don't have to spend a lot on them. I bought a cheap pair just to get started from Decathlon. They're like metal ones, they're a bit solid, they're probably a little bit heavy. And I've stuck with them because they're so strong. They might be a little bit heavy, but they're so strong. And I think they were like seven pounds, which isn't really very much. And I just really like them and I'm probably, I don't even think I'm gonna change them. I'm just using those ones still. And I don't use them all the time. Sometimes I store them on my backpack, but they've been brilliant. And I highly recommend at least trying them out. Right, my seventh tip for you is to do with navigation. I can't tell you how many times people come up and say, do you know how to get here and there? Even in broad daylight, where you're on a, on a main path, people are lost on main paths. And if you're trying to go even further away from civilization and you don't know where you are now, the chances are you're gonna get even more lost the further you go because how are you gonna find your way back? And I think it's a real problem because it's kind of easy if you go to a car park and think, I'm gonna hike up that one day. The weather can change so fast in the hills, it can just come in all of a sudden and you're in the clouds and it becomes disorientating very, very quickly. It's definitely something to bear in mind and it's worth learning how to read a map. And there's so many good tutorials on YouTube. And once you start looking at map reading courses and, uh, and tutorials, you suddenly see that there's a planning stage to your journey, working out how you're gonna navigate, finding little checkpoints that you can say, right, I know I'm here now, and working in stages as you do your journey. And actually it makes it more fun because you're paying more attention to the landscape around you. You're looking for things, you're looking for certain points and you know where you are, but you'll also feel more secure yourself. I can't, I think it must be quite scary to just walk and say, I'm going up that way and walk with no navigational aids whatsoever and get out several miles kind of into nowhere and not really knowing where you are and just eyeballing something and saying, that's the way that I'm going and I'm gonna try and get there. And then what happens if the weather comes in? You know, these mountain rescue teams are busy all the time because of these kind of mistakes that people are making. The next thing I'd say in regards to that, and it's not an additional point, it's just an add on to this, is that you should take a backup map, even if it's just a printout from the internet that you've got something that you can use as well. And then it's worth looking at other things like using GPS on the phone, but make sure you take a power bank with you so that you can charge it because as you go up in elevation, the air temperature drops and phones die so, so fast. I've had my iPhone go from like 90% to just cut out in 10 or 15 seconds, even at ground level when it's been cold, it just gone. And then you've got no way to contact if you need help. You've got no way to navigate with the phone. One thing you could do if you want to get an additional GPS that's really cheap, find an old GPS unit that will give you a grid reference that works for your map. Because then you can literally pinpoint where you are. You might not use the GPS to navigate, but like in the UK here, you can get like a Garmin Etrex H for instance, for about 25 pounds. And you can set it up so that'll give you an Ordnance Survey map grid reference. And that will tell you where you are on your map straight away. And they're, they're a bit old fashioned to use to actually navigate with, but you can get a grid reference of it and off it, and then you can pinpoint where you are on your map. That makes a world of difference. And the batteries can last for ages if you get good quality batteries in a device like that. My opinion is map read, GPS is back up. You can do what you want. That's just like my opinion on it. I think it should be that way around, but it's good to have a navigational backup. Remember, don't just rely on the fact that there's a search and rescue or mountain rescue in your area. You should try and do everything you can not to get in a situation like that in the first place. And don't think that it's not gonna to happen to you. So 
please listen to me on that. Learn to navigate and make sure you've got navigational backups as well. Uh, point number eight is kind of linked into the last one, and that is to know when to turn back. Sometimes when you're hiking, and I've done it before, I've gone up and I've just got that feeling inside me that this isn't right. I remember walking up once from the Honester Slate mine and I was going up to the top of the hill there, top of the mountain there. It started snowing and it was heavy and sustained. It came in like a wall because it was almost blue skies before, but we could see this gray cloud coming towards us. It got closer and closer and closer and then we just enveloped in it and everything goes quiet. It's really weird. It kills off all the ambient sounds and this stuff came down, the path disappeared. You couldn't see where you were, where you were going. And I just felt this feeling of like, if I keep going on any further, that was just for a hike. It wasn't like for a wild camp or anything. I just had this feeling, if I go further, I'm going to start getting lost. I wasn't confident enough in my navigation. And I thought, this isn't going to work out. Let's just get back down. I kind of know which direction to go. I'll try and find the path. And we slipped over several times on the way down as well. But we got back down and it was okay. But we had hypothermia off that as well. That's why I've given some of the tips that I've got because I was wearing cotton. I was shivering like crazy when I got down to the bottom. I mean, it was like a bit of a disaster, but it worked out okay. But it's why I'm passing some of this advice on to you now that I'm giving you is because I've made mistakes myself in the past. And uh, thankfully, I've never had to like call mountain rescue or anything like that. But I learned, let's just put it like this. When you make mistakes out on a, on a mountainside, you learn really, really fast. So listen to what I'm telling you, please. And just if you get that feeling and you're not sure, just turn back. You can go back another day. And as they say, the mountain is always going to be there for you to come back and visit another time. Okay, tip number nine for you is to do with food and water. I think you should think really carefully about where you're going to get your water from, and it's a good idea to invest in a good quality water filter. The other thing with that as well is also your food. It's important that you look at the calorie counts on things. If you plan to go out and, and hike for four or five hours, camp, and then come back again, you're going to need probably more water and more food than you think. And the reason I stress this is because if you, if you hike for four or five hours with a backpack on, if you, let's say that's your plan, you're going to tear through calories at a pretty high rate. And a lot, of the, a lot of the foods that are available, when you look at the calorie counts, I've only got like two or 300 calories, and that's not necessarily enough. And you have to remember, when you stop, you'll cool down really fast, and your body heat has to come from somewhere. It's important, this is kind of what I'm getting to with this, is that your body heat has to come from your, your own core. It doesn't magically appear and it's not going to come from, your heat isn't going to come from anything around, around you. Now you might think, oh, I've got a really good down jacket. Your down jacket is not going to heat up. It doesn't heat up itself. It only heats up when your body provides that heat for it. So it has to generate that heat from somewhere. And that's why you don't want to be wearing cotton. You need to make sure that you're preserving that heat and not just letting it escape. And you need to make sure that you're actually generating the heat in the first place from your body and you need food in order to do that. You can use exercise to heat up a bit, but then what happens is it goes again because it starts gradually all the time escaping. You need to have coal on the fire essentially, which is your food inside you. And that's the, way, that's the best way to do it, is to make sure that you've got enough calories in you, that your body's actually generating heat, and that you can, can trap as much of that as possible with your clothing, and then your body keeps generating heat. So you need to start looking at the calorie counts of things, and you need to stay hydrated properly. So having a water filter, so you can collect some water, and then filter that and drink it safely, because I know there's so many people that will just drink mountain water and say it's fine, but I've also seen a lot of people that used to do that and then they end up with the worst diarrhea on the top of a mountain and vomiting. And it's just such a, why, just don't take the risk. Just do it, do it properly, filter it. Drink filtered water. Think about heating it up as well if it's cold to so drinking warm stuff, getting warm things into you and make sure you stay hydrated and well enough fed and bring some snacks and things as well in case you need to top that up. But once you stopped, you need to be thinking that as like you have a little fire going in your body and that needs a little bit of fuel and that comes from calories. Is Walking for four or five hours and then eating like a 300 calorie dehydrated meal, it's, 
it might be okay for some people, but I reckon that's not gonna cut it for most people. Okay, and number 10 is just a really simple one, which is to do your full research on everything that you're going to do. From when we watch videos on YouTube, it's easy to see someone take a backpack out of the car, strap it on and say, right, let's go, start going up a hill and then they're walking and it looks like great, everything's good and then maybe there's a bit of a rough night and then they pack up and they come back down again and it all looks like it's great fun and so on. But what you don't always see with people is the planning that's gone into it. And the people that you're watching are most likely doing quite in-depth planning for what they're doing. They're spending time looking at any photos they can find of the area to see what it looks like. They're planning out their routes beforehand. They're navigating it properly when they're doing it. They're paying attention to the weather and what's going on around them. They're thinking about water sources. They're looking for good pitches. They've got an idea where they're going. All that kind of stuff that goes into planning and doing your research beforehand so you know what you're looking at. You know, when you look on Google, you can go onto the map and you can find those photo points. You can usually see like a 360 degree view of certain areas, at least you get some ideas. You can go onto YouTube and search those areas, see if people have got videos of walking those areas before. It's worth looking at that. So when you go, you can actually have visual references in your head and say, oh yeah, I remember this bit from that video and so on, I've seen that on, on, uh, on Google Maps and so on. You can recognize certain features as you're moving through the landscape and you're doing it more in, in a safe way when you've done your research properly. Please like, subscribe, uh, thumbs up would be great and I'll catch you in the next one. Take care, bye-bye.